Okay. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for joining the Riverwood Conservancy's webinar series. Today's webinar is Wildlife Photography Gear on a Budget, uh, presented by Andrew Budziak. And before we get to our presentation today, uh, we do have lots of events on our calendar right now for March, so please check these out at the riverwoodconservancy.org slash events to register. Anything in yellow you see on your screen now is virtual or webinars. Anything in green is in person. So we do have a couple in person programs that are still available for March break. Um, if you have time today to come by at uh, 3 p.m., we do have some spaces available still for our tree walk this afternoon. And then uh, tomorrow as well, we have our sunset stroll that will be at 6.30 p.m. And uh, that will be running uh, on the trails to go see the sunset and talk about different wildlife that you can see at sunset too. So there are some spaces available for both of those programs if you are interested this March break. And if you have the means to, to support the work that we do, please consider donating at the riverwoodconservancy.org slash donate. And as always, myself and the Riverwood Conservancy would like to acknowledge that the land on which we operate is the territory of the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation and the traditional homeland of the Anishinaabe, Wendat, and Haudenosaunee Nations. Today, this place is still home to many First Nations, Métis, and Inuit peoples, and we are grateful to have the opportunity to not only live but work on this land. And today we have a returning speaker with us um, and someone who has been doing some amazing work at Riverwood for the past several months, uh, Andrew Budziak, who is a Toronto-based journalist, filmmaker, and photographer who has a passion for telling stories about human wildlife interactions. Andrew's work has appeared on numerous outlets, including the CBC, BBC, ESPN, and CNN. In 2021, one of Andrew's images was named one of Canadian Geographic's Wildlife Photos of the Year, and I believe that photo was actually taken at Riverwood. So welcome, Andrew. If anyone has any questions today for Andrew, please type them in the comments section and we will address them at the very end. So I will hand things over to you, Andrew. Thanks so much for joining. Thank you, Stephanie. I appreciate that. Um, thanks, everybody, for, for coming in and listening to this chat. Um, I'm doing this I want to do this chat because the, the, the question that I get asked the most, and this is like in person, online, or even if I'm just shooting out in, in the forest somewhere, is what camera should I buy? Um, and I'm going to get to that question in a bit, and I'm going to get to why that's kind of a silly question. Um, and there are better questions that, that, you know, maybe we could be asking when we're looking at buying, buying new gear. Um, the first thing I'll say is that wildlife photography when you when you start it if it's a if it's a thing that you're you're looking at doing and you start searching around and you're like oh what cameras do like national geographic photographers use let's let's start there it looks like prohibitively expensive off off the top and one of the the points of my talk or, or something that i want to kind of get across is it doesn't have to be that expensive whatever your price point is you can you can probably you can probably get into it um, and, and, and in some instances, you could probably get into it for free. So I'm just going to start by explaining um, a difference between two terms that I'm going to be using. Uh, the first is the first term is wildlife photography, and then the second term is nature photography. So here's the difference between those two. Um, wildlife photography, I kind of specifically mean animals, like where the focus of the image is, is an animal. Uh, nature is more like sunset, landscape, um, you know, kind of these, these bigger scenes, these bigger vistas, maybe there is an animal in there, but the focus really is the nature. I guess technically wildlife photography is kind of under the umbrella of, of nature photography, um, but I will be making a bit of a difference between those two sort of as I, as I go on. Um, as Steph uh, mentioned, you know, I'm a wildlife photographer, that's, that's, that's what I do. Um, I also do some wildlife filmmaking, um, I've been taking photos since I was um, about 15. My school uh, had a, my high school had a dark room, so I got into like just kind of at the end of film photography. So I did you know film photography and the transition to digital. I've owned a lot of cameras. I've borrowed a lot of cameras. Um, I've you know I've, I've I've used expensive cameras. I use use cheap cameras. I've used pinhole cameras. I've made myself. So 
I'm going to share in this talk kind of things that I've learned over the years when it comes to buying gear, stuff that's going to, going to help you. And hopefully at the end of this talk, you'll, you know, if you're looking for new stuff, you'll be able to get some, get something, you know, at a price point that works for you. So the first thing I'm going to say is when you're, when you're considering doing wildlife photography and you're, you're not sure what gear you want to get, um, start by asking yourself, what kind of photography do you want to do? So there are all kinds of wildlife and nature photography. The kind that you probably think about first is like, you know, um, a, a polar bear, you know, close up of a polar bear or, you know, a giraffe on safari or something, you know, these, these big charismatic animals um, doing really interesting things, you know, killing or eating or something like that. That's probably on, on, on the spectrum of like kind of this, this realm of photography where you, you really need specific gear for that. You, it's almost impossible to do that on the cheap. So the immediate thing you think about when you think about wildlife photography, that stuff's really expensive. There's no way around it. Um, it, it just is, you know, you need, you need the lenses, you need the bodies, but pretty much everything else you can, you can do on a budget. Um, so the first thing I would say um, when it comes to that, picking your camera, is change your mind. And what I mean by that is don't think necessarily about this big long lens Nat Geo style, um, you know, the lion sitting over its kill eating away. Think about what you really want to shoot. You know, um, I, I know a lot of nature photographers that started doing kind of that, that, that big mammal stuff and then realized like they love sunsets. They love trees they love little things they love they love macro so when you're buying your gear try to think about like what what do you actually want to be taking pictures of you know a body with a big lens isn't great for all all wildlife or all nature photography so you know let's start with a place like a place like riverwood at riverwood um, i'm sure lots of you have been there you've seen the wildlife you know there there are tons of birds tons of squirrels um deer coyote raccoons, all sorts of awesome stuff. So at, at Riverwood, you, you really have, you, you run the whole gamut of what you can, what you can shoot there. Um, you know, I was, I was on a walk there a couple of months ago and just came across this like area that was all mushrooms. And I spent like, you know, half an hour just, just shooting these mushrooms and it was so great. And I had my big, big camera with me, but I put that away and ended up using my phone because big cameras aren't great for mushrooms. So, um, it really is a great, a great place. So when I, when I reference a lot of different styles of shooting, I'm going to use Riverwood as an example, because either, you know, a lot of you have been there or you should be going there. Um, so let's get back to that, that question that I mentioned off the top. What camera should I buy? The, the, the answer to that is, or what I say in response to that is, well, how much do you want? When you need a new car and you walk into a dealership, you never say, which car should I buy? because you're gonna end up being, you know, the guy's gonna show you the most expensive car in, in, in the showroom. Or, you know, buying a house. What house should I buy? Well, what can you afford, right? What's, <clears throat> excuse me, what's the budget? Um, and that should dictate, you know, we don't all have like unlimited funds. If we, if we, you know, if you do, you're probably not watching this, you're probably not watching this webinar. So like set your price point, right? It, it could be, it could be $300, it can be $1,500, it could be $15,000. So, Start with your start with your price point and be like, here's here's the maximum of what I want to spend. So once you kind of know what you want to take photos of and what your budget is, that's really going to dictate where you go and 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 what you buy. Just kind of going in blindly without having the answer to those two questions, you're not gonna you're not gonna end up with with something that you're that you're happy with. Um, so start start with those questions and then. Um, I'm going to fast forward, forward a little bit. Perhaps you have a camera at home right now and you're just like, eh, you know, I'm not, I'm not thrilled with results. I'm not thrilled with, with what I can do. Before you decide to go get a new camera, make sure you're maximizing what your camera can do. So that might mean switching from shooting just, this is a technical thing, shooting JPEG to shooting RAW. So JPEG, you know, it's just a normal, it's just a normal picture. Um, a, a lot of cameras these days, like the higher end ones and even the, the, the middle ones, and actually the new iPhones have this feature too, is where you can shoot in this format called RAW, R-A-W. And what that does is 
it captures so much more information, so much more detail in the colors. So if you take a picture and it's kind of weird and things are dark and you're not happy with the colors and you're just shooting a normal JPEG picture, there's not a lot, a lot you can do. When you're shooting raw, suddenly you have all this information in the color so you can tweak and, and get, that, get that better. So just by switching in the menu, like go through, and if you're not sure, just Google the name of your camera and if it can do raw and, and you should be able to find an option like here's, here's how to do that. When I, when I switched to raw, when I was doing digital, it was like a world of difference. Like I was using my camera, I was, I was happy with it. And then I switched to raw and I was like, oh man, this is, this is crazy. Like, I can't believe that, you know, it's kind of this, this whole, this whole new world. Um, the other thing is maybe you don't need a new camera, just, just a new lens. And thinking that your camera is not great because, because it's old, um, isn't always, isn't, you know, isn't always true. Um, the new digital cameras that have been out, let's say for the last, uh, 10, 12 years, there was a big, you know, there was a big shift like 15 years ago where cameras got really, really, really good. You know, the, the, the megapixel count that kind of dictates the resolution of your photo got, got really good. So maybe you just, you know, maybe your, your, your camera has it just dig into the menu, watch seminars, like watch stuff on YouTube, how to get the most out of your camera. You might not even need to buy one. And then, um, you know, starting there. So that's great. You don't have to buy a camera. Maybe you just like buy a new lens or something. Um, if your budget is a couple hundred dollars, like let's say you only want to spend three or 400 on a, on a new camera, consider this for that amount of money, you're not going to be able to get to do that long lens, like wildlife safari stuff with 300 bucks. You're just not going to be able to do that. But what that money could do for you is as opposed to trying to get a camper for that, um, get a better phone. Uh, you know, if you're, if you're, if you're used to, you know, not buying the latest and greatest phone, maybe that $300 is the switch between an okay phone with a decent camera to a really good phone with, with a really good camera. Um, <clears throat> I've been doing, um, recently with, with iPhone, I, I've been shooting with like kind of the, the newest iPhone. Um, and I've been super happy with, with the results that I've been getting. I've been really, really happy with the results that I've been getting with that phone, actually, and all kinds of stuff, you know, landscape, uh, little nature things. I mentioned I mentioned the mushrooms. I've even got some, like, cool wildlife stuff. I was out the other day driving and, of course, didn't have my camera with me, and there was a fox walking across the road with a squirrel in its mouth, and I, like, slowed down the car, got out, got my phone, and got some really cool cool photos with it. I was, like, super happy with it. Like, I, you know, those photos, they went up on my Instagram, and I didn't even mention that I capture these images on an iPhone because I didn't have to. So like kind of starting at the bottom for budget, you know, a couple hundred extra bucks, that might be, you know, a new lens for your camera that you, that you already have, or it might be a better phone, which is, which is great. Right. You know, and it's, it's, it's always ready to go. It's, it's always in your pocket. Um, so let's talk about actually getting into cameras. Like if you're, if you kind of want to get into the actually buying a full up, new camera. The first thing I will say about that and where you should be starting is think used. Like used cameras are going to get you where you want to go at the right price point. Um, I shoot professionally. Like that's what I do. Most of my gear I buy used. Like pretty much everything um, I buy used. I've got some gear that I'll show you in a second. And I think there's only like two things there that I didn't get used. That's that's in my, in my kit. Um, use is great for, for two reasons. Um, the latest and greatest, it's very rare that you see this like crazy leap um, in, in, in overall value or overall quality. Often it's just like little tweaks here and there. The camera manufacturers are like trying to churn out new things. But like I said earlier, you know, there are cameras that are 15 years old, lenses that are close to 20 years old now that are awesome that that still that still work that are great um chances are your photography is going to live on your phone it's going to live on social media maybe you have a favorite photo that you that you print out um but generally it's going to live on your phone or you know on facebook or your computer or whatever you're going to share share it with friends that way it's not going to be printed like gallery size so right away you know that that saves you that saves you from having to buy these crazy big expensive cameras because often 
when you see that price point, when you see a camera that's, you know, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten thousand dollars $10,000, you're paying for a couple things, you know, you're paying for kind of the speed of it, but generally that's, that's in rev resolution and image quality. And, you know, I could, I could probably go take a picture with a thousand dollar camera and I could take a picture with a $10,000 camera. And if you're just looking on your phone, you're not going to see a difference. Where you're going to see the difference is if you're doing like a really, really big, 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 big gallery photo or like a billboard or something like that, which chances are you're not, you're not doing that. So this is, that's an eight by 10 um, for the glare. That's what that size is. This is an Ikea frame. That's, that's an eight by 10. Um, this is, you could, this could be a phone. This isn't a phone image, but if you took a photo with your phone that you're happy, you could print it out at this size. Like, you know, iPhones, let's say going four generations back to like an eight or a nine or something, you could easily print out something of this size and be really happy with it. So don't get bogged down in, in all of those, all of those details, like all of those really specific, specific things. Um, so with used gear, there are a couple things that you, you want to do. First of all, you want to, you want to research that, that piece of equipment and you want to know what it can do, what it should do. Um, I never buy used gear unless I've had it in my hands and I've seen it. So it's like anything on, on Craigslist or Facebook marketplace, you know, you want to go, want to go see these things, maybe go with a friend for, for safety, but you want these things in your hand. You want to make sure they're okay. So I'm going to give you a couple quick tips on things to look for when you are, when you do have used gear in your hands. So this is, this lens is like old. This is um, a Canon 70 to 200 F4. I think this thing's like close to 20 years old and it's still an awesome lens. So what you want to do is before you test it out or whatever, just look at it. If you see like this, these bodies are so strong. If you see dents, forget it. Because if you're denting one of these, like you're probably taking a baseball bat. To it like something really bad has happened to it take the back off look around these are the contacts those are the things that actually talk to the camera share information between the lens and the camera look at those make sure they're not scratched or dirty back here and you could use like the light on your phone or kind of hold it and look around if you see scratches or a lot of like gunk in there that's also a really bad sign that should never really be exposed even like this amount of time that i'm showing you isn't isn't great i'll give that a clean later and then Go to the front, so the cap is fine. Um, look around the, the front here, look for scratches. Um, I have a little uh, filter on here to protect it. If, they're, if the filter's scratched, who cares? That's, that's fine, these are cheap. But if the glass itself is scratched, that's really bad. Like that's, you know, that's, that's gonna ruin, ruin your image. Um, the other thing that you wanna do is kind of look down the middle, like you can actually see, oh yeah, there you go, but hey, I can see right down, there's my hand, hello. Um, you can see right down the middle, and if there's any, give it a little shake, because things can break in there, and if there's anything kind of kicking around or anything that looks weird, don't, don't buy it. Um, also, look for mold. So lenses can mold um, on the inside. If there's any moisture that gets in there, they will actually get molded fungus in there, which is like, forget it. Um, and those are, you know, those are some good things to look at for. Let's say, let's say it doesn't have this, the hood on the front, but it's a really good deal. Buy it anyway, because you could get these for not a lot of money and they, you know, they're, they're easy. You can order them like 20 bucks. You can find them at Henry's or whatever. So if it doesn't have that, don't worry about it. Um, the other thing is if it's, if you're buying a lens for a camera, bring your camera, like bring your camera, hook it up, take pictures, zoom in on the picture on the back of your phone, uh, back of your camera, look around, make sure it's okay. Also, if you have like autofocus um, or stabilization on it or anything like that, test those out, turn it on on the lens. Um, and, and what I do if, if I'm using a lens that has some features, I'll actually listen. So I'll put my ear to the lens and make sure the motors that are moving in there, the little things that are moving the gears, you don't hear grinding or anything weird, it sounds normal. Uh, I've been doing this for long enough, I know what a lens should sound like. So I can kind of put my, ear to a lens and, and really listen. But if you hear something that's just sounds weird, doesn't sound right, don't, don't buy that. Um, also ask, ask the person, like, why are you selling this? Like, why are you getting rid of this? Why are you getting rid of this lens? Like, why, why don't you want it? These lenses have serial numbers on them. 
if that's scratched off, that means it's stolen. Um, someone's, you know, scratch it away, scratch that off or file that off. Don't buy, don't buy stolen gear. <laughs> Just kind of, kind of goes without saying, don't do that. Um, uh, but, you know, ask them, you know, like, and often people are like, oh yeah, I don't use it or I like, you know, upgrade it, or, you know, I just, you know, I just want to free up some cash for, for whatever. Um, and that's another great thing. Um, a friend of mine uh, wanted to upgrade some of, some of his gear. So what he did, he took inventory of everything he had, and he sold a bunch of it. And he wanted to buy a new lens for like $1,500 or something. So he just went through his camera gear, went through his house, and just sold some stuff on Kijiji and, um, and Facebook Marketplace. And just like what was in his house, he was able to buy, to buy his new lens, um, which was, which was awesome. Buying camera bodies used is, is a bit, is a bit, um, is a bit more difficult because there's, there's a lot, a lot in there that, um, that can go, that can go wrong. So right off, right off the bat, once again, look at the body, look at the whole thing if there are nicks if there are scratches cosmetic stuff that's probably a sign that it's been dropped and and beaten up a little bit so i'm just going to grab this here this is um this is a canon um 60 mark ii that i'm actually going to talk a lot about this is um a dslr camera it's not mirrorless uh and it's got, this actually doesn't come with the camera, the bottom part, so it should just look like that. This is what's called a grip, a battery grip. It makes the camera a little bit bigger. And you could put two batteries in there as opposed to just one. The reason I, I have this is I've got kind of fat fingers. And what, I, what was happening to me is my pinky was going under the camera. And I was getting a lot of pain here. So much that I had to take a whole week off shooting last spring, which is a terrible time to have to take time off. Um, I was having this like crazy pain. So I bought the grip. So my hand's just much more comfortable. These, these can range anywhere from like 50 to 200 bucks. It's just a thing I, I really wanted for my, for my hand to make it feel better. Um, this camera, the, and, and sorry, I, I'm going to talk about Canon more than any brand because Canon is just what I, what I know. I used to shoot Nikon years ago, but um, switched to Can Canon for a project and it kind of never went, never went back, but I'll get into brands um, in a second. I want to, um, I want to talk about this a little bit more in detail later on, but I'll use that as an example. So what you want to look at to make sure it's okay, cosmetic things, you know, once again, look inside, is there mold, is there gunk, is there stuff in there? Um, this is the mirror. So this is, this is a can, you know, digital single lens reflect. This is a camera that still has a mirror in it. Um, take a look, make sure that there's not a lot of gunk inside of there. Um, that's a big, that's a big sign. If there's a, a screen that moves, make sure it moves nicely. It isn't like weird, it doesn't fall off in your hand. Um, you wanna make sure all the little doors open how they should. And then when it comes to actually taking the, the, the image itself, a camera could look awesome and could fire, like could you could take your picture and all this stuff, but the sensor, so the thing that actually like records the image, that's made up of, of pixels. And some of the pixels can be burnt out, which is essentially what it gives you is you got either a hot pixel or a burnt pixel. So when you zoom in on the image, you'll see a tiny white speck. Um, this means the sensor is dying. That means it's either defective or it's at the end of its life. Um, shutters are the things that open to let the light in. Um, those can also die. So the life of a camera um, is judged by shutter count, um, which means you know how long the shutter lasts and how many images the sensor can record until it like starts to die. Unfortunately, um, a lot of the new cameras, it's harder to tell how many images have actually been taken with that camera. There are things you could go in in the menu and it could tell you exactly how many images that camera has taken. That can be tricky. You have to like just go really deep in the menu. Sometimes it's hard to find. Sometimes you actually have to export an image and get the metadata that way. A really good way to, to check for, for dead pixels or a problem like that. And, and once again, when you when you go to, to try out a camera, that person should let you let you try it. So put your hand over it, 
and take a picture that's all black. If it's all black and you kind of zoom in a little bit and move around and you see any little white specks, um, and you, if you zoom in, you could actually see it's either um, square or shaped like a little cross, that's bad. That means that that camera has um, dead pixels. And then um, uh, to test for, for hot pixels, I'm sorry, if, it's, if, it's, if you take a black picture and you, and, you, and you search in, those are hot pixels, they'll show up as white, which you don't want. Next thing what you do is like take a picture of like the bright sky or like the blue sky or, you know, like the, the side of your car, if it's like a brighter color and then zoom in and look for little, um, little black dots. And those are, those are dead pixels. So you could like zoom in on those, you know, you move around, you kind of do a quick thing. And if the person's like, Hey, like hurry up, that's a sign that the camera's probably, probably junk. Um, so those are like the really important things to, to look for. Obviously zoom through the menu, try everything, take your time, right? You're going to be giving this person money. So like, don't worry about wasting their time. Spend some time with the camera, especially if it's, if it's a little bit more money. Um, I've generally been referencing like Craigslist and, and Kijiji and Facebook for stuff. Um, Viztech, uh, Henry's, um, all of those, all of those camera places, um, they do sell used gear. Um, Henry's has an awesome used, used section. You're going to get, you're going to get good, good prices there. Generally, you know, things are, things are okay but you're not going to get awesome deals. So the benefit of buying from one of those places is they certify, they make sure everything's okay and they'll tell you a condition. So I think uh, uh, Henry's, it's, it's out of 10. So they'll say, oh, this is a seven, it's got some scratches. If it doesn't work at all, they're, they're not going to sell it. They're like, ah, you know, it's got some stuff, some cosmetic stuff. And then they'll be like, oh, this is a nine plus, or this is a 10. This is like a perfect used camera. Maybe it was a display model or something like that. So um, for, for those ones, um, for when you're, when you're buying from there, you'll get stuff that you know is going to be in, in good shape, but the prices, you're usually not going to find an awesome steal. Like you're not going to find like the deal of the century, you know, on a thousand dollar lens, you might save 500, uh, on a thousand dollar lens, you might save like 50 bucks or, you know, maybe, maybe a hundred bucks, maybe you will come across something awesome. But my experience has generally been that the peer to peer purchasing stuff, uh, is, is a little bit, a little bit better. You find your, you find your deals there. Um, I've been mostly talking about DSLR and I mean, uh, you know, DSLR and mirrorless, which is the kind of the, the newest generation of cameras. You might um, right now be, be using point and shoots. So that's, you know, kind of little, little cameras are kind of boxy. They're, they're like this, they're kind of square. Maybe the lenses pops kind of comes out of the camera a little bit, like telescopes out. Maybe you can, you know, have a couple lenses that you can, you can change. Um, those cameras are really great for nature. So those cameras are great for nature photography. Um, they're not great for wildlife photography. I have never seen a point and shoot camera, even with those long extended lenses, um, that are awesome for point and shoot, uh, sorry, awesome for, for wildlife. One of the reasons is, is that those things are meant really to function automatically and you need a lot more control when you're shooting in complex environments. The other thing is the sensors in those cameras are like really, really, really small. Um, and the optics aren't great for when you're trying to like zoom in or like see stuff away, or there's, there's a bit of motion. They, they don't have the capability um, to do like really long lens photography stuff. And I don't know, I think it's kind of a, I don't know, it's not awesome that they sell you these like big long lenses that they're, 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 the quality is just not there. That's like, that's really like, mass produced kind of consumer stuff. So just because you see the, the long lens, you know, I wouldn't, I wouldn't, you know, if you're going whale watching or, you know, going to Churchill or something like that, I'd be, I'd be, I'd be kind of weary of using those. But once again, they're awesome for nature. They're awesome for your landscapes. They're awesome for your, you know, maybe even the bird at your, at your feeder that doesn't really mind your, doesn't really mind your presence. Um, so Let's get into a few uh, specific, um, a few specific cameras, a few specific things. Um, actually, talking like price points and setups. Um, I would be referencing Canon a lot because that's what I know. Um, there are Nikon equivalents um, of all the stuff I'm talking about. Um, if you want to go follow me on Instagram, that's the best way to get a hold of me. So it's my name, Andrew underscore Budziak. Um, so if you want to follow me there, you can like DM me and ask me like specific questions later if you want. 
Um, but there, there are equivalents to everything I'm talking about in Canon. There are Nikon equivalents. So those are kind of the two, the two big players. There's also Sony. Um, Sony is like just really ramped up in, in what they do. And, you know, a lot of the big famous wildlife shooters, they're like, they're using, they're using Sony cameras. Uh, Sony's really expensive, like super expensive. And, and that trickles down even to the use stuff. So I, I use some Sony stuff for, for video. I don't use it too much for, for wildlife because it's like, it's, it's mega expensive, but it's, it's, it's incredible stuff. It's awesome. But this is, you know, the whole point of this talk is to get stuff that's affordable and you're not necessarily going to find that in the Sony realm. And because it's only been much more recently than the Canon and Nikon that they've kind of stepped up into this realm, you just don't have the used market for it either. Um, and so if you can afford it, yeah, go for Sony. It's, it's awesome. Um, but I'm going to kind of just talk about, about Canon. And, and once again, there is, um, there's always an icon equivalent, um, generally. So, um, this lens I, I mentioned, so this is, that's 70 to 200 dimension. So for those of you that aren't super familiar with, um, those terms, you're going to hear a camera referred to by, by a number. And what that is, is basically referring to how far away, you know, you can, you can, you can zoom. So the bigger the number, the further away you are, the further you can zoom. So, um, you know, like a 25 millimeter, um, you know, it's for faces, it's for your family, it's for stuff, for stuff around here. Um, when you get up to, you know, really anything over a hundred, that's, that's when you're, that's when you're kind of in, in the zoom, kind of the wildlife range. So I'm going to start with, with this. So this is an awesome, this is an awesome, awesome, awesome lens. And this is the F4. So, um, once again, not to get, not to get too technical on any of this, um, but that's the size of your aperture. So the smaller the number, Aperture the faster, the faster the lens is. I'm not going to get into to too much of that, but for those of you keeping score, I will always reference the, the aperture number of what I'm talking about. So this is the Canon 70-200 F4. I shot on this for years. This was my wildlife lens, like for so long. I have pictures in my portfolio, like meaning my best, some of my best images that that I took with this. I this is like this lens has to be getting close to 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 15, 20 years, somewhere around it. Like this is an old lens. Um, this is one of the earlier generations. I think this might be the first generation they made of this lens. Um, so you'll often have a lens with the same spec so they just upgrade, the optics get better. I love this lens. Um, I just looked online now and I found a whole bunch of these used for $500. So like 500 bucks, like that's, that's all. This is a wildlife lens. This is, this is a, this is a wildlife lens. You, you can do, you know, you can do big charismatic mammals with this. You can do your, you can do your, your safari with this. Also, um, you can do photos like this. Um, this is one I took at, um, at Riverwood and it wasn't with this lens, but it was, you know, I easily could have taken this with this lens. There's um, you know, there's squirrel just having a great time um, figuring out if that mushroom was going to kill it or not. And like, really, um, be you know, I, like I, I'm, I'm happy with this shot. I, I like this shot. And you're able to do that with with not a very expensive kit if you're if you're kind of smart and you 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 shop around um, used. So that's just you know the kind of example that you can you can uh, you can get for that price point. Um, I'm going to tell you right now. What is my, my one recommendation? So when someone's like, Andrew, what setup should I use? I want to get into this. Here's what I want to do. So here it is. And the reason I'm able to give this recommendation for this lens plus body is because I used it for so long. I've used it more than any other combo, any other setup. And I think it's an absolute steal. So. This is, um, you already saw this. I use this, this, uh, this camera as the example. The, um, this is the Canon 6D Mark II. And this is 
Sigma, 70 to 200, 2.8. So you haven't heard me mention Sigma. There are a bunch of companies, a bunch of lens companies, Tamron Sigma and a couple others, that they don't make a lot of camera bodies, but what they do is they make awesome lenses that fit on to like Canon, Nikon, Sony, Fuji. So those are referred to as like third-party lenses. Um, I love Sigma so much. Um, I and, and, you know, they'll make a camera with the same specs as Canon. In my general opinion, they're better and they're always cheaper. So, you know, they're not the big name, right? Like Canon's a household name. Sigma's not really a household name, but they make, they make awesome stuff. So I had a show at, um, at, at the ROM uh, two weekends ago now, and I had like five images up. Um, no, I'm sorry. I had, I had six images up. Three of those um, were taken with this, with this setup here. Um, so let me get into this. Why, why this is, why this is like, why I recommend this, this setup to people. Let's start with the camera. So once again, Canon 6D Mark II. Um, once again, for those of you keeping score, it's a full frame, full frame sensor. So it's got the big sensor that's going to give you lots of pixels, lots of range. Um, it's got a really high shutter count. It's, it's got, it's got every, it's got everything you need, um, in this, in this body, like everything you need. It's got lots of autofocus points. You can, uh, you can move around, uh, with this. It's got a great menu. It's, it's really intuitive. It's, it's got, it checks all the boxes. Here's why I'm recommending this. This camera, when it came out, got terrible reviews. Reviewers went off on this camera. They hated it. They bullied this camera. Um, why? Because when you get into the color science, when you read the specs about it, I'm gonna put it down so it's heavy. When you like go in and you pixel peep, there's some color stuff in the color science that these camera nerds that make YouTube videos and never actually shoot in the real world, they're like, oh, well, this is, this is useless because you know, the range in the reds is only this much and it should be this much. So there was stuff that has like no effect on your overall image or the real world that camera reviewers will jump on and criticize. Maybe they get the camera in their hands for like a week and they do some tests inside. I've been shooting on that camera for years and I love it. It's, it's incredible. Like the results of that camera plus that lens are, are phenomenal. So what does it cost? Um, because of the bad reviews, that camera, when it came out, um, was just under three grand. And the price plummeted right away because the reviews were so terrible. Um, I looked today, so new, that camera is 1800. I found a whole bunch of those used for a thousand. So like you have a full up awesome, like pro camera for a thousand bucks. So remember, um, so that camera's a thousand, remember this like 500. So this camera body plus this 1500 bucks. Um, that takes SD cards. They're really cheap. You spend a couple bucks on memory cards and that's your set. Like that's your kit for 1500. You have a kit where you can get like stunning, stunning images, um, of all the wildlife, you know, like you could probably cover 90% of everything you'd ever want to shoot with that. I know $1,500 isn't nothing like that's, that's still a lot of money. That's, that's vacation. That's, you know, that's, that's rent. That's part of a mortgage payment. Like that's, that's a lot of money. But if you're getting into wildlife photography, it doesn't get cheaper than that when you want to do the animals, when you going to, when you want to do kind of the bigger things. So, you know, it's, it's really like if, you know, as I mentioned, if you have a couple hundred bucks lying around, my suggestion would be to kind of invest it into, to a phone. Um, if you have a thousand bucks lying around, I mean, I would snatch up that body and, you know, try to find the cheapest possible lens you can just for now. And then maybe you spend a couple hundred bucks um, on something like this later on. And you never know, like you could always find a great surprise deal somewhere, right? You look online and, oh, whoa, there's that lens for 300 bucks. I'm, I'm ready to go get it. I'm going to go look for full mold, look for fungus, bring it all, you know, bring it all home, put it together. Um, there are, there's so many versions of that body. Some cameras are hard to find. That 60 Mark II, they're like, they're all over the place. Um, this lens on here, as I mentioned, 
Sigma 70 to 200, 2.8. Um, I believe this is one of the best lenses ever made. Um, the optics on it are incredible. And I'm talking even when you're getting like big. When you're, when you're printing stuff off that's huge, this lens will get you there. This lens is so, so, so sharp. It's so good. Um, it's got, the autofocus is really fast. Um, it's got stabilization. So if you're a little bit shaky, there are magnets that whip around in there and, and help this thing stabilize. Um, this lens, the only downside is that it's so good, it's, it can be hard to find. So new, uh, this is from like Henry's or whatever, is 2000. Um, used, I've seen it kicking around for 1600. So just a quick look, 16 seems to kind of be the average, you know, you could maybe find somebody that wants to get rid of it for, you know, for a little bit less than that. But uh, once again, 1000 use, 1600 use, this is this, forget about the grip, 2600 for this here. And this will last you another, you can shoot with this for 10 years, 15 years, and be happy. Like going out and buying this today, this setup is awesome. So um, I've kind of walked through the, 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 you know, with your, with your phone, if you want to put a couple, sink a couple hundred bucks into getting, getting a better phone, um, that's, that's great. Um, if you want to get, um, uh, you know, I kind of walk through that combo, uh, the, the 60 plus the 70 to 200, 2.8, that's around, um, 1500. Uh, and then that thing I just showed you there, which is like 2,500, um, somewhere around there. There's also like, something that you can do if you know what you want and you want to spend a little bit of time researching. Maybe there are older DSLRs that are, you know, 10, 15 years old. They have the megapixel count you want. You know, there are lots of lenses available. Just go research around, see what's out there. Go to the camera shops, like ask them, you know, go to, go to wherever you want to, you want to go and like, just be like, Hey, um, here's, uh, here's what I'm kind of looking for. Uh, I want something used and, you know, if the guy, you know, if the person there is trying to pawn something off, go, go somewhere else. But if you go in with an idea, like the megapixel count you want, the lens speed, all of that stuff, you know, you could, you could do really well. Like I used to buy, I used to go to the back section of Henry's um, and just look at the junk piles. Like they have these like boxes of just kind of like weird lenses okay like oh what's this it's listed for like 70 bucks okay i'll buy this um you're kind of you're kind of rolling the dice on that um and once again you're not going to get anything of the quality that i just i just showed you but there are other options out there like you know dig around and, and look and look for those look for those things um i'm going to finish with um the big steel like i'm going to go over something that i have a setup that i have and uh, show you, like, just if you're dedicated enough, what, what you can get. So it takes me months to buy new gear, like months. Um, if something new comes out, you know, I'll read about it. I'll go over the specs myself. I'll call friends that might have had it. I'll write an email to, to Canon to see what's up. Um, uh, I'll, I'll look at, once again, those reviewers, like 99% of them are junk. There is a guy um, called Jared Fro, goes by Fronos, F-R-O, K-N-O-W-S. He's got like a big, big Afro. Um, so what I like about him, he's, he's off the wall and kind of weird and kind of crazy and a little bit hard to stomach at times. But what's great about his video is he'll take a camera out and just shoot with it. And you see the results and you, you know, he kind of talks about all that, which is great. Like those real world reviews are, are awesome. So I'll watch a bunch of stuff like that. I'll do, I'll do whatever I can. And then I'll go to the store. I'll try it out. I'll see how much money I have. I'll see how much I'm actually going to, going to use that product. So I leveled up last year. Um, like I said, I was, I've been using this setup for, for quite a while. Um, but um, I needed to go big. Um, and once again, the reason is like I mentioned, I'm doing, I'm doing shows at the ROM. So this is, um, that's an example, like this size, um, that's, that's how big I, I have to blow stuff up now. So that's like, that's a gallery size image. 
And it wasn't until I started doing gallery shows that I needed a setup that could get me like that big. Um, the resolution has to be perfect. The color has to be perfect. So I'm kind of operating in this world now where everything has to be like, you know, really, really, um, really streamlined, like really, you know, it all has to be there. So I looked at my dream setup and my dream setup lens plus camera was $20,000. I don't have $20,000. That's like, that's, that's just, that's, that's, that's a lot of cash. You know, that's, that's, that's a car. Um, so I kind of applied everything I, I spoke about today. I, I looked around, I kind of look, looked at you and I'm like, I was pretty set on this setup. So the lens itself um, is a Canon 200 to 400 with a 1.4 times extender built in, um, F4 to 5.6 if you use an extender. Um, that is like one of the biggest, heaviest lenses that are, that, 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 gets, that gets produced. It's actually a custom order. So stores don't carry that. You have to call them, they call Canon, Canon builds it and then sends it out. They might have a couple at the warehouse, but that's generally how it, how it is. Um, that lens with the case for it is $15,000. So I was like, okay, that's, that's a lot. I was on Facebook marketplace and there was that lens. I thought, oh, that's weird. There's that lens listed for $5,000. So I thought, okay, here's a, here's a $15,000 lens listed for 5,000. Um, 5,000 is still like an absurd amount of money. Um, but you know, this is what I, what I do for a living. So I called the person, was talking to them, I was like messaging them and they were like, yep, yeah, it's only been used a couple of times. And I'm like, this sounds too good to be true, but I should go check it out. So we went to go meet, um, in front of a TD bank, uh, middle of the day, kind of a busy parking lot, lovely, lovely guy and, and his mother. And I was like, what's up? Like, why, why are you selling this at this point? Like, this is crazy. He's like, my mom bought it. She's a big photo nut. She's got a lot of money. I didn't realize how heavy it was. So it's been sitting at home for a year and she wants to get rid of it. And we just decided on that price point. So I said, okay, picked it up, tested it, did, did all the stuff to it, um, you know, all the stuff you should do. And I bought it. Um, and when you're dealing with that amount of money, um, if you are going to be doing stuff like that, it's great to do it through a bank. So what you could do is, for instance, if you're both TD customers, you could go in, you tell them what they're, what you're doing, being, I'm buying this from this person. I want to transfer the money this way, whatever you're buying, make sure it's in there between you two. Cause my worry was I go in and transfer the money and then that car is gone. Right, the lens is gone. So the car was sitting there between us. Or the lens was in the bank between us. And we, we transferred the money. Um, and it was, you know, they were satisfied with it. And I got my dream lens for a third of the price. And that was just from, from hunting around, from searching around online. The camera, um, which is um, a uh, Canon R5, which is one of their, their newer uh, mirrorless high-end cameras, uh, I really wanted that camera for a while, and it was a it was a lot when I bought it. It was about five grand. Um, Henry's had a day, or uh, yeah, Henry's had a day where it was five hundred off, and you're never gonna really get a much better deal than that. Um, that's really with the newest gear. That's that's the best you can hope for. Um, you know, I just I, I I saw it and I was like, it was the last day of the sale. It was three days, so I called them. I'm like I'm driving in hold that camera. I don't have many you have rushed in, paid for it. Um, the memory cards for those cameras are like a lot. So the card and the reader plus the camera was about five grand. So my, my dream kit, my dream lens kit, which face value was 20 grand. Um, I got it for, I got it for 10. So, you know, with cards and reader and all that stuff, that's a, like, that's, that's an absurd amount. Like that's, you know, you know, if you're a hobbyist, that's, that's not for you. But I, I want to show you that even at those high levels, if you dig around and you do your research, you can get it. So this is like, this is it. Um, and this is, you know, this is what I walk around with. Um, it's, it's heavy. It's a lot. Um, I'm kind of like crooked on one shoulder. Um, because of it, I use, I use a monopod. Um, but this is kind of, you know, the highest, 
but 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 um i'll say that yeah there's this it's like was like you know like said 20 grand you were 10 grand if you if you have it at the show like that show i had at the rom most of the photos like were taken on this um so like this is this is really specific like this is for really specific instances this is way more general like i i'm gonna you know throw my, the rest of my career i'm gonna get way more out of this setup than i will out of this so i just want to finish with with one image um i've talked about all sorts of of cameras today and kind of all sorts of of, of options um i want to show you my favorite photo this is from a photographer called Michel Lutzermont. Um, he's from Belgium. And uh, no, sorry, everybody. Um, really oversold that, eh? Um, okay. Here we go. I love this image. I love this image so much. It's so beautiful. It's like, it's stunning. The composition is, is incredible. And Michelle, the photographer who took this, he is like the most patient man. He probably, he probably sat for days and days and days to get this image. And I've seen this, this is, this is images a couple of years old. And something occurred to me recently looking at this image i know the setup he used for this um and you know it, you know that's probably new it's probably about a twelve thousand dollar setup but i was looking at this and what occurred to me is you could do this with an iphone um it won't be gallery size but look at this that's that's an elk far away um, he's obscured in the bushes here. He was really clever with his framing and the image and, you know, was, was just smart with not only his composition, but, you know, the light, look at that. He, he, he brought everything down. He darkened it. So you just have the silhouette and the silhouette of the trees. You, you could take that image with an iPhone. Um, there's nothing stopping you from taking breath, taking images. And sorry, I say iPhone, any, whatever, any phone, Samsung, who cares? Um, you can get images like this with, with phones. With, with point and shoots, with, you know, the camera that's been collecting dust. You, like I said at the beginning, you have to change your mind. You have to change how you think about the images that you're trying to make. Be creative, be clever, um, be smart about what you're doing and, and what's realistic for your kit and just spend time out there. Like you, you can have the best gear in the world, but if you're just sitting at home, you're not going to get it. Like go to Riverwood and practice. Um, and the final thing I'll say on that is whatever gear you're using, you can quadruple its value. You can quadruple how good your photos are by going out in the right light. Middle of the day, screeching sun, blaring down, your stuff is going to look like junk. You want to shoot at first light that beautiful light that just you know fills you here's a new day you know this those 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 that you know blue hour to golden hour is incredible that's what's going to make your image sunset same thing that incredible you know hour or two just as the sun's low in the sky wildlife is most active things look incredible if you have this like phenomenal gear and you spend all this money and you go out at noon for an hour each day your stuff's going to look not great the light's the light's not going to be there. The light's going to be terrible. <laughs> get, get value for your stuff. Go out in, in the light. That photo I just showed you of, of the elk, um, you know, that, that was probably taken um, an hour before sunrise. And it's, it's perfect. It's a perfect image that, once again, you can, you can take with your phone. You could take with, with, a, with a point and shoot. Um, Michelle, he, he just, you know, he, he, he thinks about composition. He thinks about light. That's a photo that's pure creativity. So with everything I've said today, hopefully it's a bit of a guide to like, just, I don't know, just, just some tips on a lower your price point, maybe getting a better setup for kind of less money, a couple of things to think about. But none of that matters if, you know, if you're not shooting in the right conditions, if you're not thinking about the images that you want, you know, 
a smaller setup plus great lighting plus a little bit of luck and creativity on your part like that's it that's the winning combo so um that's everything that i i wanted to um mention today so i think there might be uh some questions um that that steph has uh has collected um but yeah thanks for thanks for this and hopefully it was some help so um yeah steph any any uh, questions i'd be happy to answer them yeah for sure thanks so much andrew for um as always such an informative uh talk and for always breaking down the barriers i would say to wildlife photography because for a lot of us, um, yeah, we can't afford the $20,000 gear. So it's great to hear um, your tips and stuff as well. So we do have some questions coming in on Facebook and now I see on Zoom as well. And if any of you are watching right now and have some final questions for Andrew, please type them in the chat bar now. Um, the first one that kind of came up uh, on Facebook what is, um, what are some of the other phone cameras you would recommend other than iPhone? Yeah, so um, the um, a lot of the new higher end Samsung uh, cameras have awesome uh, phones. Have um, have awesome uh, cameras to them. Um, I think the Pixel, like the Google phone, I remember hearing some some good things about that. What you want to see um, doesn't matter, like the phone that you're that you're getting. What you want to look at is the pixel count. Um, so where they are. They're going to be much, like the pixel count is like much, much smaller. Don't get confused when you hear um, for video uh, 4K. When you hear about that, like this video resolution stuff, they try to they try to sell you on that. For stills, because it's, it's a small sensor in there, right? Like it's, um, like for instance, on, <clears throat> on you know, the, the like those cameras that I showed you, like if a full frame sensor is about that big, let's say the equivalent on a phone camera is significantly smaller. So you want to maximize the, um, the, the pixel count. And then also um, on like so many new cameras, most cameras now have, have multiple, multiple lenses. Um, and go, I would say go find examples online that people have taken of actual photos. And in some cases you can actually download the images that people have taken. So do that to compare, zoom in. If they're raw, take them into your raw processing um, thing like, like Lightroom is used to process raw images. But once again, just just do your research um, and don't get, once again, don't get bogged down by the video specs because those can be really deceiving. Figure out your, your pixel count and try to get some real world, um, yeah, options. Awesome, thank you. Um, another question from Facebook, what would you say is the optimal focal length or lens for wildlife photography while just walking around? Um, uh, you know, once again, 70 to 200 is, is awesome this $500 thing, um, you know, 200 is, is, is great. That's, that's pretty far. Um, you know, unless you're shooting once again, like polar bears or stuff that's really far away. Most of the stuff in Ontario, Southern Ontario, 200, 200 is going to do it for you. Um, I, I don't know, like there are um, extenders that you can put on, which would double that, but you're losing, once again, it's getting kind of a bit technical. Um, you're losing F-stops. So the F4, if you put a two times extender, I think that pushes it to like an F8 um, and muddies your image a little bit. So just be careful with the extenders. If you have a setup and you're thinking of including an extender on there, go rent them. They're usually like anywhere between mm -hmm. 20 to 50 bucks a day. So um, you could go to um, Viztech and, and Henry's, uh, sorry, not Henry's anymore. Viztech will rent you that little thing, pop it on. Um, be careful with, with rentals because often you get, you can get, stuff that's really scratched like i've rented big lenses and i'm like this is unusable like this is junk it shouldn't be rented out but um you know extenders don't get rented out so often so at least they'll kind of give you give you a sense before you before you purchase awesome um is olympus a good brand for wildlife photos olympus is getting into it a lot more there's um there's an instagram for a photographer i know on instagram her handle is brooke little bear uh, she is quite, she's quite good. She's an Olympus, uh, photographer. They're, they're really trying to get into it. Um, I really like her final product. She, she manipulates her images a lot, um, like doing things where she like black out the background or extend the canvas. So she kind of combines wildlife with, I guess, this kind of like fine art aspect. Um, 
but Olympus has in the last couple of years really kind of gotten into it. Uh, longer lenses. The the only the only issue with Olympus, I would say, is because they're kind of more recently in the game of wildlife photography, you don't have companies like Sigma making lenses for an Olympus mounts. Mm. I could be wrong. Yeah. I mean, that might have changed recently. I, I could be wrong there, but I, I don't believe you're going to find a lot of third-party lenses for Olympus quite yet, or 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 the range um, anyway. But yeah, Olympus is Olympus is is great. Um, they're they, they can be a little bit um, pricey, but you know if you if you like Olympus, there's no reason why you should should go for them. And are those within the same price point as other? Are they comparable with other uh, cameras? Yeah, they are. I mean, once yeah, I mean they are. I think I think once again, just because Canon and Nikon have such a huge range of of like of options and prices, Olympus is going to be in there. I, they're not, um, as far as I know, I, I could be wrong here, but they're not kind of where where Sony is um, for those price points. But you know, it's all they're all they're all within that range. Awesome. Um, we have a couple more questions, if that's okay with you, Andrew. Yeah, yeah. Um, Lynn has said, thanks for the great talk. Is a macro lens for an iPhone good enough quality to be worth getting to take plant and insect photos? Funny question. Um, I was invited to have a seminar with um, like a one-on-one -on -one with, with an Apple technician. And we spent an hour and he was, Apple's really excited about the new macro stuff. I can't, I could not get that macro to work. I couldn't, I couldn't figure it out. Like my, I was taking macro at home. I'm like, this, this isn't, this isn't good. Like, why isn't this, why isn't this working for me? And I asked him, I'm like, what's happening? What is the macro on this? Because there's not a macro lens. There's, um, there's the wide, the medium and the tight. There's no, like none of those are actually macro lenses. So what, what's actually happening is the super wide angle when you go to macro, the super wide angle is being cropped. So you're able to get close. You're able to get really close because of the wide. And then it kind of takes over, over digitally. So what I realized, and then you're losing, you're losing a whole bunch of resolution when you do that. So the second I heard that, I'm like, oh, why don't I just kind of turn off the macro feature and shoot wide? You could get just as close, but you lose a bit of the depth of field, but you're getting the resolution. And I was like, oh, here we go. So I kind of had to cheat it a little bit. And I think that's something because iPhone is pushing the macro feature so hard. I think the next mm. one is going to have a proper macro lens, but it's, you know, you're already, already on a really small sensor and you're going to the macro and it's cropping it again. So even on my phone, it looked like I wasn't super happy with how I looked, but once I realized what's actually happening, I was kind of able to cheat it. Um, and you can still get really close. Even if you're not doing macro, you can still get some, some really awesome plant, um, awesome plant stuff, awesome mushroom stuff. Um, so after a lot of like, trial and error, I, I would say, yeah, if you want to get some like nice close-up stuff, um, the, 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 the iPhone, the new iPhone will, will let you, will let you get there. Awesome. Uh, Debbie has asked, um, I invested in a new camera that I need to learn how to use. I purchased the manual, which is 300 pages, but it is quite overwhelming. Any suggestions on where other than then YouTube, I can get lessons. The above camera is a Sony RX10 IV. Other than YouTube, um, YouTube's pretty good. Um, you know, like you might find someone who could just walk you through. I don't know why you wouldn't want to use um, YouTube for that. I'm not sure your reasons, but I mean, even on my cameras, when I'm trying to fight, figure something out, the first thing I do, I've been in the field on video shoots where like a camera dies and we're like, uh-oh. And our first thing is YouTube because somebody else has probably had this problem with the questions. And then you could also just Google the name of your camera, uh, quick setup, um, you know, quick, quick setup. Like how do I get the settings or how do I do this or how do I do that? Um, and try to look at like specific questions. You could do just general how to, but it's like, you know, best settings for wildlife. Someone else has probably done that. And once you do a, enough of that, you'll get familiar with things in the menu and then you can start piecing things together yourself the more you go and then the camera, then you get to this point where you just know every little thing, every little nook and cranny that's that's in there. So you're, you're educating yourself based on other people's trial and error. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I always go to YouTube as well when I uh, have questions. I find people are experts on there. I don't know what I'm doing. <laughs> 
Um, Jenna's asked if you're traveling and don't want to bring the lenses, but wanted to take wildlife pictures, is there a way to do it? Or a lighter version of the lenses? Glass, glass is heavy. Lenses are heavy. Um, that's all it is. Like if you don't, I mean, the only option would be depending on where you're going and the country. I mean, if you have a big lens like that one I showed you, um, you could rent one in that country, mm -hmm. perhaps. Um, just, you know, maybe just invest in a case. I mean, they're, they're heavy. That's it. Like, <laughs> they're heavy. There's no way around that. You can't change physics. You can't change optics. Um, yeah, so the only thing I would say is just to maybe, maybe rent when you, when you land in that country. Um, otherwise, yeah, no pain, no gain, right? Um, and then Lynn just wanted to clarify, uh, her previous question was not clear. She was asking about adding a separate lens to an older iPhone that doesn't have a macro lens. Oh, um, yeah, those are, yeah, those are weird. Um, they're like, so, so what, what it is, it's just like, some of them look like little thimbles, like they're these things that kind of clip on. Um, mm -hmm. you could, you could, you could actually get adapters for like, these lenses that you can put on there's this whole like rig that you can do that with um i haven't had too much luck with any of that they're really cheap like i've seen them for like 30 bucks buy it and give it a, give it a try you know i don't know um uh, with those you, you never know i haven't really had any luck for instance clipping clipping those things on um it's just you know optically uh, I've never found anything that looks looks too awesome and they're finicky and sometimes they don't even work. But you know, if it's cheap, give it a try. You know, if you can, if, if it if it um, if it's within your price range and you're curious enough. But I, it, it's something that I couldn't I couldn't tell you a brand or a make where that would be a, a great a great value from anything that I've experienced. Right. Yeah, I, I have one myself too, and I find it it's uh, a lot more work. And especially if you're taking photos of insects that fly away very quickly when you're trying to take a photo, it's not the greatest thing. <laughs> I would I would just stick oh. with your iPhone most of the time. Yeah. <laughs> um, and then we have one final question question that actually came from the start of your program. Um, can you use automatic when shooting in raw or only manual? Yes. Yes. So, um, when you are, when you switch to, uh, raw, that generally is like, isn't superseded by anything else in the menu. So the way that you, the way that you, you, you check. So on the top of your, so on the top of your camera right here, you have on a lot of the cameras, you have a little dial that spins around between your modes. Um, it's generally there somewhere else, but generally it's a, it's a little dial. And, um, once you're, once you're flipping around in there on your display, it will say on pretty much like any camera, it should say JPEG or raw. So flip around to your mode. And if there, for some reason it switches it back to JPEG, go in and tell it to do raw. Um, I can't think, sorry, uh, I can't think of a scenario where the automatic mode would would supersede your selection for for raw or um or jpeg it's just not really not really built like that just be careful with the intelligent auto modes or sometimes it's called a plus or i a um those go in and do all sorts of kooky things so once again just just double check but like 90 percent of the time you should be should be fine Awesome. Thank you so much, Andrew. I think that is all of the questions. There's lots and lots of questions and also lots of great comments that came in just saying thank oh, you. And it's very informative and helpful. Um, thanks for the inspiration. Lots of people on Facebook saying thanks as well. So uh, we appreciate it as always. Andrew, did you have any final words before we end the webinar? Get out and shoot. Go to Riverwood. Go shoot. Go, go practice. Chase the light and have an awesome time. That's awesome. Thank you so much, Andrew, again. Hopefully we'll see you uh, in the next, another webinar. And yeah. uh, thank you everyone for joining us. Um, and we'll see you in the next one. Bye. Thanks, Andrew. Bye, everybody. Bye.